So let's start writing some things down. A scalar, scalar, that's how you write that. It's magnitude only. Now, what do I mean by magnitude only? It means there's no direction, no direction info. Now, once I start giving you some examples of scalars, you'll understand why that makes total sense. So some examples of scalars would be something like temperature. Uh, it would be pressure, like air pressure. It would be time. Even though we say time flows, but if you think about a moment of time, there's no direction to it. That moment is time equals something. So that's a scalar quantity. Volume of a gas, like 34 cubic meters or something like that. We've already talked about this one, speed. It tells you how fast you're going, meters per second, but it doesn't give any direction information, so it's, it's a scalar. And just another example, mass, mass of an object. So let's just kind of go through these real, uh, real quickly and understand what that means. So if you have the temperature, there's a temperature in space here where my finger is. It may be, you know, 27 degrees Celsius, right? And there's a temperature over here, 34 degrees Celsius. Those temperatures are different, but there's no directionality to this temperature. If I measure the temperature here, which way is the temperature pointing? Is temperature pointing that way? Temperature pointing that way? No, we, we know it's just not pointing any particular direction. We just know that this point in space has a temperature. So it's just a number. What's what we call magnitude. Magnitude is how big the number is, right? All of these share the same kind of thing. The pressure, you might think pressure has a direction, but at this point in space where my finger is, the pressure of the gas is acting in all directions, pointing in, into this point, right? So at this moment, at this point, the pressure, you know, 34 newtons per square meter, or whatever the pressure is, it's not pointing any particular direction, it's a value at a point, okay? Time, we already talked about. Volume, if I have a volume of gas here in this little space, we say maybe it's 34 cubic centimeters, but the volume, it's not pointing any direction, it's just a value. Speed, we already talked about, and mass. This marker has a mass of, you know, um, 0.05 kilograms, but it's not pointing any direction, it's just a value that we give, a magnitude. So scalars are, are things you've dealt with all your life. They're, they're not pointing any particular direction, they're just, uh, they're just, um, values, right? <clears throat> so I've already kind of used my finger to gesture here, but just as a picture that you can kind of keep in your mind, if you want to think about a three-dimensional space like this, right? This might be X, this might be Y, this might be Z. This is, this is my uh, kind of a corner of a room showing you here's the flat surface, here's the volume of space, X, Y, Z coordinate system, right? Then you might have over here some distance R away from the origin, right? You might be measuring, let me switch colors to make it a little easier to see. At this point in space, there might be temperature T. So you might be measuring it in, you know, like I said with my finger, 50 degrees Celsius or whatever. And then if I swing this, this R around pointing any other place in space, that at the tip of this arrow, the, 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 this arrow is just representing where I'm measuring it, right? Um, I can measure here, measure here, measure here. At the tip of this arrow, no matter where I point it, it's just some number T. So it's a scalar quantity. The temperature is not pointing in a particular direction. All right. Now, because these things are um, not pointing in any particular direction, we kind of use regular variable names to describe these guys. So scalars are just a number. We use regular variables to describe them. So in other words, we might use um, T for temperature right? T is equal to something. We might use lowercase p for pressure. We might use V for volume. We might use M for mass. We might use lowercase t for time or something like this. But the reason I'm, you might say, well, this is kind of stupid. Why is he mentioning this? It's because when we have vector quantities, vectors include a direction. So vectors are going to have a little arrow above the variables to tell you that they're vectors. So before we kind of get to the vector part, I'm showing you scalar. So just know that when you see a variable in a textbook and there's no arrow on top, it's just a scalar quantity. It's just a number. It's some number, whatever value it is at that location, that's what it is. Now let's walk ourselves to the other board and talk about the concept of what a vector is. I've uh, mentioned it several times in, in passing in the class because they're so important, but now we're finally getting to the actual definition. It's a quantity, that means quantity, that has magnitude, 
just like the scalar does, magnitude, but it also has direction. So when we give some examples, you'll understand immediately why it makes sense that scalars are different than vectors and why we categorize them differently. So the best example is going to be velocity. Right? I'm going 34 meters per second, or I'm going negative 37 meters per second. The negative sign carries sign information. Now, that is just, we talked about so far, we just talked about motion along one line where the only way we can go is forward and backward and the sign takes care of it, right? But in three-dimensional motion, when I can go up and back and, and to and from you and so on, where I can go any direction in space, then we'll have vector, the vector is the total direction in three-dimensional space that you're, that you're traveling. So you may not be just going forward and backward, you may be going this way, that way, whatever. And so we'll keep track of all of that, you'll see how we, we do it later, by keeping track of the motion in x, y, and z separately. But as a quantity, when I throw the baseball over there in three dimensions, it has a direction associated with it and a magnitude, so we call it a vector quantity. Now another vector quantity, one of the most important ones, is force. When I push on something, I'm pushing in a, in a direction. Either I'm pushing along positive x, or I'll turn around and I'll push negative x, right? So the force could have plus or minus components also, and that tells you which way you're pushing, because it obviously has a direction associated with pushing. Another quantity is acceleration. We haven't talked about acceleration yet. We're going to define it in not too long. But acceleration, you all know from a car, is when you speed up, right? or you might slow down. Actually, we call that deceleration in everyday language when you slow down, deceleration. In physics, we don't really talk about deceleration. What we say is you have acceleration in a positive sense, meaning that you, if you have positive acceleration, you're speeding up. But if you have a negative acceleration, that's what we actually call deceleration in everyday language, is when you're slowing down. So you see the acceleration variable has vector, has a, a sign associated with it. Positive acceleration means you're speeding up. Negative acceleration, not something crazy, it just means you're slowing down. So it's giving you the direction of your speed up, slow down kind of thing. So that's why it's a vector. There's a direction associated with acceleration, not just a magnitude. And then we're gonna just list the, the remaining here uh, we're going to get to these much, much later, but for instance, just to kind of give you a flavor, uh, magnetic field, electric field. I'll draw some pictures in a second to help you visualize this, but it doesn't matter so much for now because we haven't studied this yet, but you've all seen magnets. You know magnets interact with each other. There's an invisible field we call a magnetic field. That field is a vector field. In other words, every point in space around the magnet has a strength, but also a direction. It's pointed different, different ways. Those are the field lines that come out that we kind of can't see them, but that we think they're there. We know they're there, and we call those vectors, uh, vector quantities at every point. So this is the difference between scalar and vector. So let's draw some quick examples uh, here. So if I have a ball um, that I'm going to throw, and I'll throw it this direction, uh, the velocity is 37 meters per second. Notice that this, the, the speed of this ball is a, is a magnitude. That's the 37. So it has a magnitude, check. And it also has a direction. I'm going up and to the right. Right, so it's a vector quantity. That's all you have to ask. Does it have a magnitude and a direction? If yes, it's a vector, right? If we were just talking about speed, we would tell you that it was going 37 meters per second, but we wouldn't really tell you which way it's going, so it wouldn't be a vector. That's why speed's not a vector. All right, let's take another quick example. Let's say we have a crate, some kind of a box sitting on the floor of my living room, or whatever, and I'm going to push on it with a force. So I'm gonna represent that force as an arrow. So force, 10, Newtons. Now I know we haven't talked about the unit of force yet, <clears throat> but just a preview for you, it's going to be called a Newton. And we'll talk about why it's called a Newton later, it's after Isaac Newton. But anyway, it's a unit of force. I'm pushing with this magnitude, but I'm also pushing at this direction. So that's why force is a vector. It has a size and it also has a direction associated with it. <clears throat> now just to give you a little bit more of a flavor, since we're going to be spending so much time talking about vectors, we'll just take just a couple seconds to draw a couple of other things. Let's say you have a, instead of a ball, let's call it a proton. So I'm gonna put a plus charge in the center. You all probably have taken basic chemistry or basic physics, so you kind of know 
more or less what a proton is. Those are the things in the center of the nucleus. Well, around this proton, we, we say that this electric field exists. And the way that we represent it are these arrows that kind of emanate kind of magically. It's not really magic, but it comes and emanates from the positive charge. And so this thing, these, these lines here, these uh, red lines, this is called an electric field. Now, really, you could insert a word here. It's the electric vector field. That's what it really, it's a field of vectors. In other words, at every point in space here, there is a value. The length of this arrow, we're going to get into that actually in just a second to kind of make it more clear, but the length of the arrow represents how strong the field is. And the direction, of course, specifies which way it's pointing. So there's this invisible field around all protons, right? Or any kind of charged object that emanates from it. And that electric field is what interacts with other matter and pushes it all around. That's how we our modern theories of electricity and magnetism work. And very similar to that, you probably have an idea of magnetic field. Okay, magnetic field, electric field, right? Now, how would we represent a magnetic field? We'll just draw our friendly neighborhood bar magnet because we, I know that you all have um, some experience with that, with playing around with those things. And we can't see the magnetic field, but we know it exists because it, you know, we can interact and push on other magnets and such. And so the way we talk about it in physics is we say there's a invisible magnetic field lines that come out here. This is the kind of stuff you learn in you know, basic, basic science in like third grade. But what you didn't learn back then is that this, these lines have direction associated with them. That's why we put the arrows. These are like little arrows that exist all throughout space here, like this. So you see how the magnetic field has a strength and also a direction. That's what the arrows are telling you. Which way is it pointing? And the electric field has a strength and a direction. And the force and the velocity have a strength and a direction. That's why all of them are, are vector quantities. And then you have these things that don't have any direction. All of these examples, they don't have any direction, so they're just called scalar quantities. All right. So how do we represent vectors? I told you way back here, I said for scalars, uh, we use regular variables, just like any variable, you just write them down, okay? Vectors, you might see it written down slightly different ways in different textbooks, but most of the time, we represent vectors uh, right with an arrow on top. Sometimes you'll see it written slightly differently, but most of the time, this is what you'll see. Uh, if I, uh, well, I guess I should say the length of the arrow, well, hmm. yeah, I'm kind of getting maybe a little bit confusing. Length of uh, arrow gives you the magnitude and the direction of arrow gives you the direction, obviously. Yeah, I kind of got a little ahead of myself with the way I wrote this down. What I'm trying to say by write with an arrow on the top is I'm trying to say in an equation, like if I'm going to write down an equation for velocity or something like this, then I'm going to use the variable v. But I'm not going to write it down like that because if I leave it like that, you're going to think it's a scalar. You're going to think it's some speed or something like this. So I write it with a little arrow on top. Then you know that's a vector quantity. Okay, that's a velocity, right, vector. If I'm going to write down an equation for acceleration, which we will have many, many equations with acceleration, I'm going to put a little arrow on top. You're going to know that that's the acceleration, right? If I'm going to write down a force, which maybe I'll write down Newton's second law of motion or something like that. This is a force vector, the little arrow on top. And if just to give you a crazy example that we're not going to do anytime really soon, but if I have like E with an arrow on top to go back to our electric field, this would be an electric field vector quantity. So anytime in an equation when you see a letter with an arrow on top, you need to think that's a vector, right? And when you see an equation with a letter with nothing at all, then it's a scalar quantity. Now, I am going to tell you that some books are different. Some books, instead of an arrow on top, just put a bar on top, okay? The problem with that is that gets confusing because some books indicate a bar on top, just a straight bar being the average value of something. So like the average of grades in a classroom might be great, the, the variable with the bar on top. So it can get confusing if you just put bars on top. But when you're doing your homework, sometimes you just quickly just put those bars and so that, that's what happens. Also, some books don't put the arrows at all. They just bold. 
So you might see V, but a capital V with a bold, that means vector. So it depends on the book you're using, but most of the time you're going to see vectors with an arrow on top. Now, this part of what I'm saying is dealing with what I wrote down here, right? Uh, vectors with an arrow on top. This is what I was trying to say here. This stuff down here, the length of the arrow and the direction of the arrow, this is how we write down vectors um, to rep actually represent the values. So let's say, for instance, I have a ball here. And I'm going to draw an arrow like this, and I'm going to say 10 meters per second. And the arrow indicates the direction I'm throwing the ball, and the magnitude is indicated by, obviously, the number. Now let me go over here, and let me throw a different ball, but I'm going to draw it downward, and I'm going to represent this one as 15 meters per second. Now, it's important for you to see that the lengths of these arrows are different. See, this one, I'm representing this length of an arrow as 10, and I'm representing this length of the arrow as 15. So with vectors, when you write them down as arrows, you draw, if it's a stronger value, a higher magnitude, you draw the arrow longer. The length of the arrow represents how big the number is. The length of the arrow here is shorter, the length of the arrow here is bigger, because obviously these are different values. So just by looking at a... Um, just by looking at a, um, uh, a, a picture of arrows, you can see that the longer ones are stronger. And obviously the direction here is pointing down, the direction here is pointing up, the directions are totally different. Right, so just to give you another example, so this is velocity, because we all have experience with velocity. Let's quickly talk about force, because it won't be too long before we actually start dealing with equations uh, that deal with force. So just another example, um, what if I have a vector this long, I'm representing it as 60 newtons, I told you the unit of force is newtons, we'll get to that later. And then I might have another force here acting differently that's going like this, and this one might be 30 newtons. Do you see, I'm not perfect with this, but do you see how this vector is about half the length, maybe it needs to be a little longer, about half the length of this one, because this one's 60 and this one's 30. So it's the same kind of thing. Vectors in general, the length of the arrow represents how, how strong it is. This one's shorter because it's a less force, basically. All right? Um, so reality is well, this is what's going to happen. We're going to work here in the first part by representing vectors as arrows, as these arrows. Because graphically it helps you visualize what a vector is. The length of the arrow is how strong it is. The direction of the arrow is which way the thing is acting or, or moving or whatever it is it's doing, whatever you're measuring, right? So we're going to talk about arrows. We're going to talk about graphical ways to write these vectors down in the next few sections. But then what's going to actually happen is we're going to throw away the, the graphical pictures entirely, and you're not going to really use those very much solving real physics problems. You will use them some, but you're not going to be drawing tons of arrows all over the place to solve problems. You're going to write equations. So we use the picture, the vector picture, the graphical cartoons to visualize it. Then we're going to gradually move into kind of getting rid of that and, and kind of not needing that so much. It's very much like learning to add negative numbers. We use the number line first to show you how to add them. But then after a while, we kind of stop using the number line because you don't need it anymore. But it's a great tool to start with. So that's what we're going to do here. So follow me on to the next section. We're going to continue talking about vectors and specifically representing them graphically and how to deal with vectors in physics. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.